You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. Today, John Harris and I will be talking about photography workshops, what they are good for, who they are good for, and why you should consider going to one. We'll also highlight the many different types of workshops available to the photographer and touch on trends within this rapidly growing industry. Our guests today are Alyssa Adams, photo editor and managing director of the Eddie Adams Workshop. Also with us today is Miriam Evers, a multifaceted photographer and founder of PhotoQuest Adventures. Welcome to both of you. Before I begin, I just want to say that your feedback is really important to us. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video with the hashtag BH Photo Podcast or email us at podcast at bhphoto.com. If you're currently driving a car, wait until you get to where you're going or pull over to the side of the road before you're doing either of these wonderful deeds. Uh, we're going to start by talking uh, about the Eddie Adams workshop with uh, Alyssa and as well as uh, talking about photo quest adventures with Miriam. And after that, we're going to have an open conversation about workshops in general. And there's a lot to talk about. Let's start with Alyssa. Uh, tell us about the uh, Eddie Adams uh, workshop, its history and anything else you want to throw in about it. Hi, Alan. Thanks for having me here today. Pleasure. Sure. The Eddie Adams Workshop uh, was started by uh, photographer Eddie Adams approximately 29 years ago. And um, Eddie, oh, when we first started it, we weren't married. We got married uh, a year after, but it was 1988 or 89. So we're going on our 29th year. And Eddie was a, a he worked, uh, he's worked many places. First place he worked was the AP where he won uh, a Pulitzer for a shot in Vietnam. And so uh, he, he started this workshop because, you know, it was just something that he always uh, wanted to do. And he just likes to share and he likes to be with other photographers. And he bought this place upstate near the Catskills, a barn, with the idea of having this workshop. Were workshops current? Back then? Yeah. You know, I think people, it was like back in the 80s, like I found some old paperwork of Eddie's, like handwritten you know, first he did this workshop called iPhoto, and like I don't think it was a common thing, and you know, but I know that he had been to World Press and he had won a lot of World Press awards, and I think he really liked that community. You know, he never told me this. I kind of just this is just conjecture on my part. So I think he wanted to have that kind of com camaraderie and um, uh, experience together uh, here. So like back in the '70s, he was looking for property. And he wanted something with a barn, and he got it, and it was just dilapidated. And over, like, 20 years, he fixed it up. Um, anyway, getting back to the workshop, he <laughs> was preparing this barn for this workshop. And back in the 80s, like, mid you know, late 80s, when everybody was flush, you know, all these companies, he was talking to Kodak and Nike, and he says, I want to do this workshop, and I want to have 100 students come, and I want, I want all my friends to come up there, and we're just, and we're going to shoot pictures and show pictures and talk and 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 whatever and you know they said uh well gee that sounds really great eddie but you know why don't why don't we start with like 25 or 50 you know since you've never done this before and he's like no so um <laughs> he just started big and i i think that's actually and he said i want it to be tuition free and i want it to be big and i want all my friends to come up and um and not get then they're not going to get paid because they're going to do this for fun. So those, <laughs> that's kind of what you know, kind of how it started. Did he check with anybody else before he came it, up with? It? Yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> well, miraculously, they all came, and it was like a four day, you know, weekend party, and it happens. It's usually it's always four days, uh, and now it's always over Columbus Day weekend, and uh, we pick a hundred. Uh, it's a juried process. You submit your work. And you're hand selected, and um, is it open to everybody or anybody? Yeah, you can either be a student or a young professional with three years or less experience. Okay. Yeah, so they come up there for a weekend of uh, shooting, portfolio review, listening to speakers, and um, you know, running around Sullivan County, shooting pictures, and at, at the end, it culminates in a presentation. And, and is it it's mm -hmm. primarily photojournalism? Or it's primarily it it's primarily photojournalism, and you know that word is actually kind of a new word. Eddie didn't really like that word. Uh, I don't know. That was probably coined in the '40s or the '50s or something. I'm not sure, but he he wanted to think of it as a photography workshop because he always liked to have interesting people up there, like um, like some artist or some car photographers, you know, like Ralph Gibson or um, 
people that just weren't just photojournalists. Straight photojournalists, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. And yeah, so that's kind of the the, the basis of, of of the workshop, and it's been going on for um, thirty years. And is it still tuition free, and still it's, has the same set of guidelines? Basically, it's still tuition free, and you know the formula works. It's a hundred students. We divide them up into ten teams of ten, and they're each led by a photographer, an editor, a producer, and an IT person. Mm -hmm. And basically, you know, each team will have a subject. You know. Uh, dairies or you know or farm life or something like that and they'll go out and they'll shoot that assignment and um and then the team puts together the show at the end and they like you said it culminates in a, in a show and um the format has kind of like for some reason it just works you know and it's 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 a big networking thing you invite people like joe rosenthal gordon parks you know Izzy from life. Those were his heroes. Mm -hmm. And he said, I just am so thrilled to be here. And I just want other people to be here as well. Mm -hmm. So I saw some interesting videos that came mm -hmm. out of the workshop while researching for this episode. When did video enter the, the, the picture, for lack of better words? You mean in terms of video being produced at the workshop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We kind of trickled it in, like the first 10 oh, yeah. years or whatever, it was all film. And then one year we did one digital team. The next year we did two. Then we did five. Then we said, and then we did it all digital. And then, you know, multimedia was the big, the big thing. So like Brian Storm came up and he, he did a couple of, like he did one or two multimedia pieces. And then the next year there were more. And then we just said, hey, let's like, let's really blow this out. And so, you know, every team had a multimedia facet. There was a short segment there where we did that, but now we kind of gotten our focus back to, um, stills but people do incorporate sound they do incorporate you know some short pieces of video every once in a while but you, you know you're dealing with time you're there for four days and when you're editing media mm -hmm. you know you're trying to edit like three hours worth of work and it's like it's it's we, we well, know it's it goes crazy. into just doing okay, this one, a, a podcast <laughs> is supposed to go for under now so but back in, when in the film days how did the uh the processing and the developing work somebody from the time life library would drive a van down to the workshop and pick up all the film, and uh, they process it and bring it back the next morning. Mm -hmm. And who's the sponsor? Um, Kodak was our, our major sponsor then. And one time they brought up one of their processing trucks. So that was fun. So they processed right oh, on wow. the site. And Nikon has been with us from, from day one and still with us, which is pretty amazing in this world. And did you know that next year Nikon's going to be 100 years old? And the workshop is going to be 30 years old. So it's kind of amazing okay. when you think about it. We've kind of been together like... You know, a Long third time. of one third of their yeah, third of, yeah, yeah. exactly. That's so, great. that's pretty cool. Well, can you mention some uh, some photographers who started as students and have now gone on to uh, great careers? Uh, sure. Uh, Tim Rasmussen was at workshop one, mm. and he, you know, I don't know if you know, he's at ESPN now, formerly of the Denver Post. Where under his, you know, I think his paper won like two different Pulitzers in the last couple of years, and then before that. I can't remember where he was, maybe Fredericksburg, I can't remember. But um, so that's Tim and then Bruce uh, Strong, uh, who's up at Syracuse now. And then um, um, Dan Winters mm -hmm. okay. uh, was there the very first year. <laughs> <laughs> the very first year we did this, the barn wasn't quite complete. <laughs> we had, we had uh, uh, an electric line. We amped up all the power, you know what I mean? And so there was an open ditch. From the bottom of the hill, you know, like a football field length up to the, uh, or more up to the barn. And it was open, you know, and um, it was a day, it was a day before a workshop and some kid came early and there was this, uh, what do you call it? A backhoe thing mm -hmm. just sitting there. <laughs> and the kid says, Hey, do you want me to fill this in? And Eddie goes, you can do that. He says, sure. So he, he filled it all in for us. And, um, that kid was Dan Winters. Oh. And um, <laughs> the next day, you know, when the kids, right before the kids were coming up the hill, they walk up the hill, they get dropped off on a bus. And so they're walking up the hill at four o'clock in the afternoon. The sun is shining right in their eyes. They can't, they can't see anything. And, they're, and we're all like applauding them as they come up the hill. And that's kind of like five minutes before they walked up the hill, the power just got kind of like connected. So it was a, it was a scramble the first year. So he met Greg Heisler there. He met Jay Maisel. And I, you know, because at that point, I think he was working at a newspaper. He was more of a photojournalist at that point. And then I think he, you know, he got a little mentorship from those two guys. I think he came to the city and stayed with one of them or something. And like, obviously, you know, Dan Winter's career is like kind of amazing. And he came back to speak uh 
what, like two, three years two ago? Two years ago. Two years ago. So, um, photographers yeah. tend to be like real social animals, so this is a natural organism for yeah. photographers. That's what it I'm It seems getting. like the camaraderie and the, right? the yeah. rustic setting and the, yeah. <laughs> the yeah. you know, this yeah. aspect is part of it, right? But it, it is. Then that's why, you know, I always said, Eddie, why don't we do one of these in the city? And he, he's, you know, he's, like, he's looked at me like, don't you understand? It's being isolated up there <laughs> where there are no other distractions, you know, that makes it a part of it. Okay. Miriam. Tell us about PhotoQuest Adventures. So, uh, well, first of all, thanks for having me today. Pleasure. Thanks for being and, here. Um, and I also want to clarify to the listeners that I actually work for Alyssa Adams. I'm the producer of the Eddie Ams Workshop. So I know everything that she's talking about. Yeah. <laughs> so PhotoQuest is an offshoot or is it just no. something you came up with? on your, uh, Give yeah, us the background of how this uh, all came about. My business partner, Najat Naba, and I started it eight years ago. Okay. And uh, it's very different from the Eddie Ams workshop. We do travel photography workshops all over the world. For much smaller groups, I might yes, add. Yes, we, we don't like large groups. We, we only take 10 to 12 maximum. Uh, most of the time we take 8 to 10 people. Uh, in some locations, only 6. It depends on where we are in the world. Uh, we charge tuition. It's not like the Eddie Ams workshop. <laughs> It's a travel photography workshop that is a little bit different. We, we take people to off the beaten path locations in the world. We try to go to countries where people don't want to travel to by themselves. Do you so, go to these places before you go around the world? Or do you, or, most of the places I've been to. But, yeah. but you've also been there for the first time with the group? That, well, that doesn't happen very okay. often. Most of the places we've been to. Because that could be to, fun. <laughs> no, it is, it is fun. It actually has happened that we... Like, for example, we went to Papua New Guinea a few years ago, and it was also my first time when we okay. went with the group. Um, so, yeah, that's really exciting um, to go to a country for the first time and bring a group. And do you, you, go, to all, do you go to on all the uh, the tours, all the adventures? I, do, I go on all the tours, and um, Najad and I, we split some of them. Uh, we also hire other photographers to teach. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's the two of us, or sometimes it's me and another photographer. We work with different freelance photographers. And usually the um, ratio is two or one photographer for every five guests? Yeah, guests. yeah, or four sometimes. sometimes. So, yeah, we keep them very small and intimate to make sure everybody has a great experience because that's the thing about large groups. It's very hard to have that same experience when you're traveling in these countries. Who is your workshopee? Is that the word that you would have? Yeah. Uh, yeah clientele. Yeah, we... Who, um, who is your clientele? They're mostly doctors, lawyers, accountants. Ologists, I call them. Yes. <laughs> okay. I love them. <laughs> uh, they're all, you know, they, they love photography. They love traveling. They do photography as a hobby. And they probably have amazing gear. They have amazing gear, better than any of us. Probably <laughs> sure, yes. And they I've shop at B&H. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> and we tell them what to buy and they buy it. No, I'm kidding. But, um, yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're very well traveled and... Uh, we have a lot of repeat clients as well, which is great for us. We travel with a lot of – every tour we do, we have at least two people that have been on trips with us before. They're all very talented photographers. It's in, interesting. There are, we have a few clients who are so good. They could actually be working as a photographer. Have you seen anybody do that, change careers? To yes, we have through our – through our workshops. Uh -huh. um, one of our clients, her name is Amy Harris. She, um, she's an engineer, and she just switched to oh, becoming wow. a photographer full-time. Really? That's and she's great. Yeah, and she's amazing. And But we see so many clients that are so talented. I always say, you guys should be working as a photographer, but how can you give up that salary? Yeah. I've been shooting for decades, but honestly, in the past year and a half, I started dabbling in surgery. So it might, be, it might be the same thing. It might be connected. I don't know. You need to change. You need to change. This is a year-round? Yeah, have, we do. Uh, we offer about eight to ten workshops a year, mm -hmm. all international. In the past, we've done domestic workshops. We've offered lighting workshops um, and, you know, city, let's say city tours. But we yeah. kind of stayed away from those for a little while, and this year we're going to start doing New York City workshops again. What are the most popular destinations, can you say? I was going to ask the um, oddest also. It's kind of weird because the more off the beaten path our destination is, the more popular. Mm -hmm. So like Papua New Guinea, we, we did a couple of years ago for the first time and that filled right away. Mm. Um, I think people want, are looking for workshops um, and, and countries where they really wouldn't go to by themselves because they would be too scared. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so they're looking for something that's different. As, there, as you know, there's there's thousands of workshop companies out there. They're all doing the same thing. They're all competing. Um, so we try to offer destinations that are a little bit different, where we can give access to so places and people. And, you know, we've been doing it for a very long time, actually. So I think it's important to to offer not only clients coming away with really good images. We set up a lot of images for them and shoots, um, but also having that cultural experience, meeting with locals. We really involve our groups with local activities and uh, giving them this cultural experience. So travel and tourism is a big part of yeah. it also. Yeah. yeah. What about and language? Do you, do, you, do you make sure that you have somebody who speaks the native tongue yeah. wherever you go? Or have I you mean, ever just gone in and saying, let's just see what happens? You know, we it's between Najan and myself, we speak nine languages. Uh. So it's a really that's a really huge benefit you know, for we us. We can get you a job here in the store. Uh, if you yeah. speak my language. Just, I'm, just I'm keep in. it in the line. <laughs> <laughs> that's that goes right up. That's good around here. So yeah, we we actually just returned from Egypt and Jordan a few days ago, and we were there for ten days. And and I don't speak Arabic, but Najat does. So it's 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 amazing because we work with local fixers and and guides and. We have a really good um, tour operator we work with that works with, uh, for example, e Egypt Tourist Office. But being there and, you know, even if you try to ask fixers or, or your guides to set something up, like we wanted to do a shoot for sunset, for example, at the pyramids, and there were no tourists there. It was just our small group oh, and some wow. Chinese tourists. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to have some camels with the sunset. And, you know, Najat's like negotiating and talking to them and <laughs> and then it gets done and it's it's a huge benefit when we travel and also we can hear what's going on between the guide and mm -hmm. the drivers and you know right. we make sure our clients don't get ripped off because that happens a lot too oh, I'm they're trying sure. to make money off of us and sure. that's a normal thing and of course we give back and we donate to to charities and schools and villages but you know our trips are not shopping trips but we do offer some time on a tour for people to buy things and we make sure that they don't get ripped off because that's, that's you, uh, you mentioned giving back can you talk a bit about the sustainable travel international yeah what we do is um partner up with different organizations um just recently for example Alyssa knows him as well we partnered up with john Rowe. um he has a uh, organization called omo child so we're doing a trip to ethiopia and then we're gonna give we're gonna donate money to the Omo Child organization and we also bring like printers or these Fuji inst Instamax, Instax, Instax, Instax just uh -huh. little things like that to to just give pictures. We were recently in Panama for New Year's Eve and it was very hard to photograph the tribes uh, in the San Blas Islands in Panama. Mm -hmm. They're giving, they were giving us a really hard time and uh, then I was like, oh, maybe we need to try something else. So I started taking little pictures and giving them out. And then all of a sudden, the whole town was lined up. They all wanted a picture. Yeah. And it's nice. And, and we've done that before in really remote places where people have never even seen a picture of themselves. And it's it's so rewarding to That's one to of the unique things that. about a Polaroid or instant photograph. Yeah. I mean, you could, it's one thing to look at the picture in the back at the right. screen of the camera. But when you could hand somebody a physical yeah. print... That yeah. goes so far. And is there a uh, an application process or no? I mean, it's pretty much we take good, any anybody beginners. You don't need to see a portfolio. A, no, or, no, or, it's really like if people are interested in the destination and they can sign up, register. So it's open to any level of photographer as well. And the people stay together. Is there kind of a, a, com a camaraderie in the community? Yeah, and, I mean, it's you know they're all well traveled people most of the time. I would say ninety five percent of the time we get well-traveled people that love photography and so it's it's a you know they have um, what to talk about like-minded group um you don't get for example somebody who wants to stay in a five-star hotel and the other people who want to do their own lodging in a, in a pension no we we stay together as a group okay. um but your lodging spans all those different types of places that's right yeah we we travel around we don't stay in one place mm -hmm. um and we also stay in five-star hotels where possible, not in very remote locations, obviously, then we stay in the best possible, like in Ethiopia is one of them. In the Omo Valley, there are no five-star lodges, but you stay in the best possible locations. And the clients know that it's not like they're going to 
sign up and be in for a surprise that, you know, it's really like a minus one star hotel. So <laughs> roughing it in your group basically means having breakfast by the pool. That's right. Okay. <laughs> right. Yeah. So. And we do glamping instead of camping. <laughs> 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 yeah. And do you guys help with paperwork for travel and uh, yeah. immunizations if necessary? Or are people we, just kind of on their own and they show up? We kind of help them. And some clients, you know, they really are busy. We really try to make everything as easy as possible for them. Really, they sign up and they show up with their gear and then the rest is is all taken care of. What about the, the photography side of it, like the educational just, side of it? Okay, Sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to yeah. do that. No, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, you know, we work with individual clients and like I said before, we have a lot of repeat clients, so it's nice for them to learn something new. So we always push them. Um, if we have beginners that really don't know anything about photography, they don't know anything about their camera settings. They just bought an, uh, a camera from B&H and they have the camera in the box still and they don't know what to do. We help them set it up. We teach beginning we teach everything. What happens too is that we have so many people that are of advanced photographers and they also help each other out. So it's a nice thing we have, you know, the official photographer teaching, but then we have our clients also, they're helping each other and, and everybody learns from each other, which is a really great environment to be in. It's the same as actually being at the Eddie Amps workshop, the team leaders that are there for the 10 teams, they always Get, come away with, from that workshop being really inspired again and, you know, are excited it, about right? photography. About, about, you know, the camaraderie and yeah, the collaboration and yeah. inspiration. But do you have classes? Do you start the day with a, a type of class? Yeah, we do. It, it's very um, casual, you know, but we offer reviews of their work every other night and uh, we do everything. I mean, I, anything the clients want to. If they say we want to do a Photoshop class or whatever they want to learn. When we do night photography workshops, obviously we focus on night photography and there would be a class before we go out to do a night photography shoot. You know, we teach them how to shoot, etc. cetera. So uh, we, also teach, we also teach lighting. Um, if they want to learn how to light, we always bring that lighting gear with us. What kind of gear? Is, is speed light type stuff or we bring larger? Uh, both, yeah. I bring speed lights or, um, you know, uh, Pro Photo B2s. Okay, well, those are to, ideal. Yeah, yeah, and they're so small and portable. So, yeah, we kind of do so everything. So you have those, and if somebody says, hey, I want to try something, Yeah, we this. always bring them. So yeah. that's a good value there, yeah. too. Yeah, We're going to take a short break and come back and talk about other aspects of workshops. We hope you're enjoying this edition of the B&H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at BH Photo Video, hashtag BH Photo Podcast. There are a lot of workshops out there. There's no shortage of workshops. If you Google it, you'll, you could spend your whole day just fishing through them. Um, some are better than others. Some of them have not very good reputations if you read the reviews on it because I think what's happening, uh, and I see it online a lot, is that a lot of photographers, uh, a lot of people in the creative arts in general, uh, it's harder to earn a living these days. And workshops seem like a good avenue for making up income or paying your bills if, if photography is no longer doing it. And also there's some people who are downright not really qualified. They might be able to take a good picture. It doesn't mean they're qualified in running a workshop and teaching and instructing and, and creating a great atmosphere and a great experience for photographers. Can we talk about that a little bit? Have you, how's this affected you guys? It's a problem for sure. And we know a lot of people that have traveled with other workshop companies and they give us feedback and, and they complain and and it's definitely an issue. And I know photographers are trying to, they're all struggling. That's a fact. So they're trying to to come up with other ways to make money, like you said. Um, but it doesn't make them qualify to run a workshop company. You Here's know? a question for, for both of you. Somebody who's going to be listening to this podcast saying, hey, you know, I have, I thought about workshops, I've been considering it, and I don't know what's best for me because everybody has a little need and a niche. And if they're looking to look around for a workshop to do, what kind of questions would you recommend they ask? Well, they should look at, obviously, you know, if there is a, a program or a schedule and, you know, who the teachers are. Uh -huh. Obviously, the cost of it and where you're staying. And um, 
just, you know, if they have a mission statement or if they have... Well, you need to look toward your area of interest, too. As you mentioned, wedding mm-hmm. photographer, and, and we know people that run night photography workshops. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. It's, it's a specialized uh, f- industry, right. right? Basically, it is very specialized. And and, uh, and, and some um, uh, some notable people will have a list of workshops on, on their site or their blog. I think if you... You look for if there's somebody that you trust, either a vendor or somebody, and you look at who all the people are that they're recommending. I think that's actually a good way. To, that's a good to point. Look at, look at all too. the logos mm-hmm. on the bottom of the page. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good point. And then Very you can point. kind of break down workshops into different categories. I mean, mm-hmm. you have ones that are let's call them educational to some degree. Like the main workshop is, is well known, or mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or even out out west, the Santa, Santa Fe. Fe. Yeah where you get, I would say, more students, people that are looking to develop their craft, and you have others where they are specifically toward night photography, like we mentioned, and then you have travel-related yeah. workshops where people really, it's a combination of photography and adventure or, yeah. or, or tourism, whatever you want to call it. So th- I think that'd be a good place to start, I mean, knowing what you want to do with the workshop. Right. right. I think it's hard, too, because um, if you're interested in, for example, going to... Uh, let's say Bhutan or Papua New Guinea, and you're you're looking at all the other workshop companies that offer it, if you don't know, if you've never been to the country, you don't really know what to look for. I do because I put the trips together. Right. But if you're Credibility. Like a, if you're an amateur photographer or you're just interested in traveling, you don't really know what to look for and what to ask. I mean, like for example, if I was a doctor or, or a lawyer and I could afford it, I wouldn't go to a country and stay in a two-star hotel and be miserable. I obviously want to stay in a five-star hotel, you know. But I isn't think, that part of the uh, the thrill, staying? No, it is, of course. Of course, that's a, that's that's definitely uh, a thrill. But I'm just saying, like, you have to look at the quality, what's being offered by a workshop. Like, for example, I notice a lot of workshop companies, they, they offer a workshop somewhere and then, the people have to carpool. They have to rent cars and carpool to the to the destinations. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, why would you sign up for a workshop where you That's have to drive your own it, car? No. And it doesn't matter if it's if it's if you're staying in a in a if you're camping or if you're whatever, however you're doing the workshop, you shouldn't be driving to a destination to shoot. Like that's just cutting corners by the company who's mm-hmm. putting on the workshop. Unless they gave each participant the Porsche 911. That <laughs> that's right. I'm, I'm yeah. game. So yeah. So that. that's one thing like that we always do. Um, we always t- charter buses or vans or, you know, we, we, well, we, think, we you take know, care of all the logistics. But here, these workshop people have to rent their own car. They have to book their own hotel rooms and... You know, that's just, to me, is one thing that is a good question to ask. Do that's you, an excellent question. Yeah. Well, it seems to me that yeah. one of the most important parts of a workshop experience is, is to, the togetherness. The com- and, camaraderie. Yeah, and, and Yeah, I and agree. If you're driving separately to a location, a meeting, it yeah. doesn't really yeah. fit the And bill. I know the workshops that do that, they're obviously saving money because they're not chartering a bus or a van, you know. Mm-hmm. So do, these little things I think people should look for when they're, Signing up for a workshop. These attentions you don't need, especially when you're landing in in a place where you've never been no. before and no one speaks your language. You want to know that you're being taken care yeah. of. That's yeah, that's important. Yeah, and that's also so the important. hotels. Like everybody should do research on the hotels you're staying. You know, even though there is an itinerary listed, they should check out the hotels and look at their website and and look at reviews of the of the hotel mm-hmm. because you could stay in a four five star hotel. It's listed as four five star hotel, and then when you actually Read the reviews on Yelp. Um, you know, it turns out to be a dump. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they do change the linens every single day, but unfortunately, it's from one room to the next. <laughs> right. So, yeah, you got to yeah. read the small type. Yeah, and that's um. kind of, I think that's what people should look for, you know. Mm-hmm. Personally, I'm, I think I'm the type of photographer who likes to separate myself and kind of go for a long walk by myself. Okay, it's two of us. Uh, <laughs> so, can you speak on the idea that? Workshops maybe aren't for everybody, and have you had the experience where a photographer comes to the group settings and it just doesn't work for them? Sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we've had the same thing. Yeah. Sometimes we do get people that kind of want to do their own thing, and we, we give them that time if we go into a village or we say, you know what, you have three, four hours, do your own thing, we'll meet back at mm-hmm. dinner, right. and they do their own thing. Actually, on this recent Egypt and Jordan trip we were on, somebody was shooting with a pinhole camera. Mm. So 
you know, she needed a lot of time <laughs> to shoot everywhere. So she really needed to have her space, literally, and do her own thing. So we would, you know, we we worked that out. I didn't mention earlier that the Eddie Adams workshop, I didn't mention who the faculty are. The faculty are people, oh, yeah, please. The, the faculty are people like the photo editor of the Washington Post or, you know, the Denver Post that are like from different publications. And you're working with people who are actually are in the in the industry and, you know, the photographers that are published, you know, all over the world, you know, Pulitzer Prize winning photographers, you know, involved. And so, you know, as a as a student, you know, you well, you would assume that everybody would want to would want to do their best, you know, and everybody's given an assignment. But it's always surprising because there'll be one person that'll go to their assignment and they'll say, well, you know, and they'll come back with no pictures and they'll say, well, it just wasn't interesting to me or something like mm -hmm. that. So, you know, that's the person, you know, you're every once in a while you come across one person. the artist in the group. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And it's fine to be an artist, but like come back with something, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's like. The Eddie Adams to some degree is almost a, a career builder for, or a career starter for a lot of people. Uh, that's a different type of situation than the travel one, obviously. Yeah. They're kind of required to, to do something a little more. They're also invited scholarship winners to some degree, right? Right. So. Well, it's, it's a tuition free workshop. So on some level, yeah, they have to, you know, they have to pay the room aboard and they have to get there. But mm -hmm. other than there really is no tuition and, and all the faculty, all the people that are there, the photographers, photo editors, they're all donating their time. So, you know, everybody, you know, everybody wants to be there. And so, and everybody for the most part, like wants to do, do a great job, but you know, there's always going to be somebody that has a different idea. No. Have you ever had instructors who are really very good and very well accomplished, but aren't really good as leaders? As it at the end of the day, it turns out they were not. They didn't really know how to communicate what to look for and well, how to get people to think, get them it, juiced. It's interesting when you're dealing with that many different people. You're dealing with ten teams. You're dealing with ten different photographers, ten different photo editors, ten different producers. So that's thirty people, and 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 each one of the, and within their own group, they those three will have a different dynamic. So. You know, some people are very hands-on. Uh, some people are not hands-on at all, and some people will come up with an idea. Like Vincent Lafare was a uh, team leader one year, and he said, "Okay, we are going to do. We're going to shoot all in black and white, and we're going to do the decisive moment." That was a very impressive show at the end of it. And then other people are okay, like, um, "Okay, this is the town of Liberty." <laughs> Go, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and those people also like, you know, the people that are self-starters, they'll come up with something very interesting. But, you know, and then, you know, some of the groups like the editors will uh, let the students be in on the edit. And some of them will be like, you know, you go over there. I don't want you what to be a part of this. What do the editors do during the day? They're out. They're just having a glass of wine where all the photographers I, are shooting what, all day. Are they playing golf? Yeah. What are they doing? They're I playing can't golf. Go <laughs> <laughs> Lucky. And, and do, the, do the leaders, or in your case, do you guys shoot when you're on these trips, or do you tend to not? I shoot, but I always help the, the clients if they need help or walk with them. Mm -hmm. But we've experienced that as well. The good thing is that we, you know, if we hire other photographers to help teach that if they're not good, we don't hire them again. Mm -hmm. And it's happened to us, too, where we hired uh, photographers who are just really shooting for themselves the whole time mm -hmm. and don't really spend time with the clients or have no desire to help them. So oh, that's, not good. Then that's you, a slow burn. Ooh. Yeah. Then you work with them once and then you cut them off. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, but it happens. Can we go back to the subject that we touched on earlier, which is this idea of photographers turning to, to their own workshops as a, as a ways to either make ends meet. I mean, there's several photographers that I've dealt with here who are what I would call very successful photographers who are now kind of transitioning away from shooting. It could be a, a stage in their life, but it seems to me more about the fact that it's it's more lucrative for them to run workshops than it is to go out and and shoot photos. Is that uh, a trend that you've seen? And yeah, has I mean, it it's diluted been... the market to a problematic degree. I mean, I think it's uh, it it's a fact that a lot of photographers are struggling. They're you know they're not working as much with budget cuts, newspapers folding, magazines folding. So everything is, has changed, as we all know, in the last few years. So um, yeah, a lot of photographers are starting to do workshops. But even though they are successful photographers, it doesn't mean that they have that knowledge and experience to run proper workshops or know how to communicate the or, information. I was going to say, I think just think being a photographer is a very different, a very interesting experience, and I think it. Um, 
a lot of photographers are natural teachers because they they do have to think things through whenever whatever they're doing. And whether, photography is yeah. communication. Right, right, right. And you know, you have to think through what you're doing, whether you're on assignment or you're in a studio or whatever. You have to like think through the process and everything. So I think that I I think that some of them are may could could be natural teachers, you know, because they have they have to go through that process. Cool beans. Are we allowed to do a commercial? Yeah, sure. For anybody that's out there that is a uh, photography student or a young professional with three years or less experience, the applications for the workshop are now open. And the deadline is uh, May, the end of May. But, and we require like uh, that you submit 20 images. And, you know, there is, we do charge an application fee. You know, at one point we never charge one, but now, now we have to because it's just the times. And also don't be afraid. To submit your work. I mean, don't um, some people are like, oh, I've heard of the Eddie Adams workshop. I don't think I'm good enough. And, you know, y we take 100 students. That's a large group. So your chances could be actually pretty good. So just would you say mm -hmm. that the people, the applicants are, are getting better, more sophisticated over the years, uh, the photographers in general? Yeah, I think that I think people are, are just are just smarter, and I, I, I and I you know also what what you also see when you look at the uh, applications is, is you can see how the professors are actually teaching. Like it used you know when we first started doing this, there was a uh, like okay you shoot your singles, you shoot your sports, you shoot your politician, and you know you've got five frames for like maybe your own little story, and that used to be just kind of how a lot of the student portfolios came in, and you could kind of predict like what school they were from. Or or whatever and you know I think people are and then people are now more like uh, a little bit more narrative based a little bit more story based and they're a little bit more sophisticated but um, the students stay in a five star hotel yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's the name of it Cats <laughs> right. is five star hotel yes okay, okay. alright thank you Alyssa thank you Miriam thank you John our producer and my co-pilot and thank you Jason our engineer check out Eddie Adams and eddieadamsworkshop.com and PhotoQuest at photoquestadventures.com give us your opinions on Twitter at BH Photo Video with the hashtag BH Photo Podcast and please rate and leave a review on iTunes my name is Alan Weitz thank you so much for tuning in today <laughs> <laughs>